Welcome to your community. This is your hometown. This is Walton Entertainment. This is where you can hear from the community and those making a difference. We explore topics, local festivals, arts and entertainment, and local news. For this program and much more, visit us online at yourlocalstream.com. That's yourlocalstream.com. Why not? 
Um, but this is our lobby. So it's, our center is very child friendly, very trauma sensitive. While children are at our center, the alleged offender in the case is never allowed there. So if it's a parent, a caregiver, a relative, whoever it is, they're not allowed on property. And law enforcement is always there. So if they come, law enforcement gets to handle it. So we don't have to deal with it. Um, we also have a separate room where law enforcement, defects, other people sit during the interview so that the children and families don't have to interact with them, especially the children. Um, when children experience abuse, primarily sexual abuse, which is the largest population we see, there's a process called grooming that goes along with it where a person doesn't normally just see a child, grab them, and touch them and abuse them. It doesn't happen that quickly. It's a process where the person breaks safe boundaries, um, grooms the whole family really, manipulates the family so that you know they get access to the child. And some of that can also include threats like, you'll go to jail or I'll go to jail, you're get, you'll get taken away. So if they see a police officer or a defects worker right, right before we want them to talk about what happened, they likely won't talk about it. So not having to see them there helps them be able to talk. So they talk to our staff. Um, we're all women. Everyone's very nice. Uh, we, we would like to hire a man. Great. Talking. Hasn't happened yet. Or find a nice one. Right. That's what I'm saying. I know. I'm busy. <laughs> we had one male intern one time. It was great, and then he moved on. Um, but this is our forensic interview room. So in that room, it's the child and the interviewer, who's our staff. Um, there are exceptions, like we've done a deaf child who used ASL, so we have an ASL interpreter, but no one else is generally allowed in the room. So there's, you can sort of see a camera up here, and then this little plate is a microphone, so there's two cameras. There's one that shows the whole room the whole time, and then there's one that can move and zoom. So if the child's writing something, you can zoom in and see what they're writing. So that's the interview room. There's two choices. They can sit in the comfy chairs, or they can sit at the table. We have fidget spinners and Play-Doh and things they can do to occupy their hands while they talk. Um, the forensic interview process is, it's an interesting way to talk to kids. It's not how adults usually talk to kids. So it's a semi-structured protocol that our interviews, interviewers follow to get information from the child. So they're very well trained. Um, Lindsay, one of our interviewers, has interviewed over a thousand kids, so very experienced to get this information from kids. And it's in a way that's developmentally appropriate um, and just, you know, gives, it's very open. So instead of like, you know, what happened, it's like, tell me everything about what happened, and then going back to say, tell me more about this part. And so non-leading, non-suggestive, we don't introduce any information. If a child doesn't know anything when they come in, they aren't going to know anything when they leave. And then this is our medical room. We also have new medical equipment. So again, I was telling Debbie we're about to update our brochures. These are like the last ones. So we have new pictures and new everything. Um, but we have a, as child-friendly as a medical room as you can get. Um, but we've got the comfort frog on the table. It has weighted hands and feet, so it can like wrap around a small child and help make them feel, you know, kind of like a weighted blanket if you have more of those. And we have little child-sized cloth gowns so that they can be in a cloth gown and then we cover them with blankets. Sometimes people, actually often, people will donate blankets so they can cover up with the blanket and then we can send them home with the blanket. We send them home with teddy bears or toys or you know, kind of whatever we have, we'll give to them. Um, we also partner with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. So the physicians and nurse practitioners at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta are super experts in their field. So they can view our exams live via telemedicine. So you know, when we first started, it was super new and super cool. Now lots of people do that, especially thanks to COVID. But we can have the specialists at Children's Healthcare observing live while our nurse practitioner is on site with the child conducting the exam. Um, so we offer those basically anytime there's any sort of physical contact, we'll do an exam. Um, again, we look for evidence, but we don't often find it, but we do, you know, we check and then we, it can be really reassuring for kids and parents, I think, to know that like your body is healthy and it looks okay. Um, so our services, I've talked a little bit about the forensic interview. That's, hopefully that's the first time the child's really had to tell what happened to them in depth and hopefully the only time. We do the medical exams and then family advocacy is where we support families. When a child experiences abuse, it's most of the time, 90% of the time, someone they know and trust. So a friend of the family, a family member. So it disrupts the whole family system. So our trained family advocates work with the non-offending and involved caregivers to figure out what's next. 
Do you need counseling? Do you need financial support? Um, you know, was the person who <coughs> did the abuse the breadwinner? So what are you going to do? So we work with them to kind of create that plan and execute it. We do a lot of counseling referrals. So we have really great counseling partners. We don't have on-site counseling. A lot of child advocacy centers do, but we don't. So we refer to the communities we serve. So we covered Newton County and Walton County. So we have people in both places and throughout. And with virtual therapy now, there's even more access, which is really great. Um, then we do case review and tracking. So every child that comes through our center, we meet to talk about once a month with all of the involved partners, which we call our multidisciplinary team. So it's DFAX, law enforcement, the prosecution, because the state prosecutes the child abuse cases. They don't have private attorneys. It's the state, so we meet with them. We meet with uh, the school system, mental health partners, medical, and then our staff we meet once a month to talk about every case that's come through our center. Um, even in cases that don't, sometimes, like little babies, we can't see, but we can still staff the case to see what's going on. Um, so we do that monthly. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of community education. April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. We believe that child abuse can be prevented. Hopefully, we will get worked out of a job one day. Maybe not in our lifetimes, but hopefully one day. Um, so we do a lot of community education, things like this, that are you know shorter and a little more informal. We also offer some standardized training. So there's a Stewards of Children, which is a sexual abuse prevention training that's two hours long. It offers continuing education credits for people in the field. Um, we do a mandated reporter training. So any adult who works or volunteers with children in any capacity in Georgia is a mandated reporter. So we train them on what that means and what they do and how it works. And then another one called Connections Matter, which we really like. It's a little more general about children who experience trauma because there's all types of trauma, right? It's not just sexual abuse. It's not just physical abuse. It's not just the kids we see. There's lots of different types of trauma. So we train people on what do we do about that? How do we be a good neighbor and be a good friend and make connections with people to help them build resilience? These are our cases per year. We started in 2006. We started seeing kids in 2009. So we have steadily increased. 2017 was a banner year. That's when we got the additional space across the street. It was like we were too busy. We need more space. We only serve one family at a time. We only have one forensic interview room, so we needed another. So the building across the street has kind of a second satellite setup. Um, in 2020, when everything shut down, we didn't. Um, we had to figure out, be creative, how to still talk to kids, because we've got our interviewer and a kid in a room, so how do we do that in times of COVID? But we figured that out. Um, most, most reports of child abuse come from the school system, because that's where kids are most often with mandated reporters. So we thought we were going to slow down a lot since kids were in school, but we really saw more of like a change where we saw more child witness to domestic violence or those types of cases, online crimes because kids were online more, so people reaching out to kids online. Um, we saw more of that. So we stayed busy. We expect that our numbers will continue to go up as kids are back in school, and we'll talk about you know what may have happened during that time of sheltering in place when kids were stuck at home with potential, you know, abusers. Uh, these are our referral statistics for 2020. We're usually pretty evenly split between Newton County and Walton County. So the sheriff's offices are our main referral sources and then the local police departments as well. Um, we see a good bit in Walton County. So that's where we're at. It's uh, over a hundred, so over a hundred kids from Walton County came through our doors last year. Um, it's usually around 230, 240 pretty evenly split. Um, we see boys and girls, so it's not just girls who are abused, it's boys and girls. Um, and same with ages, we see all different ages of kids. So anybody who needs our services can come, they don't pay for them, but they come in and then we provide the services they need. Um, I've talked a little bit about what happened in 2020 and what changed. Um, we have, you know, we shifted where only one caregiver can come with a child, we ask them to wear masks. We don't force the kids to wear masks, obviously, during the interview because we want them to be comfortable. Our staff wears a mask. Um, you know, we do the temperature checks. We kind of did the same thing everybody else does, extra sanitizing and air purifying systems and all that. Um, but yeah, we didn't slow down. We are concerned still about what may have happened to kids while they were at home. So we're kind of gearing up for that whenever kids start telling. Like I said before, it's really common for kids to delay their disclosure to not tell. 
I think the time for a boy to disclose sexual abuse is like 20 years since it happened. So by the time they usually tell, I mean, they're grown, if they even tell at all. I think 38% of kids never tell that they were abused. Um, court, so our forensic interviewers, our, our medical staff will testify in court about the interview they conducted and also about the dynamics of sexual abuse. I mentioned grooming earlier a little bit. People don't often understand how it works. Our brains don't want to. We don't want to think that people can do this to kids. Um, so our interviewers will testify about, you know, here's why this maybe doesn't seem quite right or maybe why the child said this, kind of what it means and testify about the dynamics of abuse. We are not the people who say yes, abuse happened or no, it didn't. That's on the investigative agencies, law enforcement and defects. So we just gather facts, gather information from the child and then let those people do their jobs. Um, but court is delayed. You know, court, I think they're just now going back. So it's been a year of no court. So we will spend more time in court. And if you've ever been to court, you know, that can be very time consuming. So our staff ends up spending a lot of time prepping for court and sitting at court and then it gets continued and then they go back. But that's a service we offer because it's so important that the jury is educated about child abuse, especially sexual abuse. I really think people still think that um, it's only girls and it only happens in these situations. You know, just the understanding of how it works is really important that our juries are educated. Funding, we're a private nonprofit, so we rely on community donations, on grants, and we're concerned about what, what's going to happen from COVID, from the economic impacts of COVID. So we were able to get some COVID support, like a lot of other people, to help us through the year. Um, but that's something that we are interested to see how it's going to work. Our community has always been really supportive of us since we started in 2006. So we trust that we will have what we need, but it's certainly on the radar. Um, as of October 1st, there is a statewide CSEC response team, which is the Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children, or what we call sex trafficking. You've probably heard about it. It's a very much a hot topic right now, and it does happen in our community. So as part of the statewide CSEC response team, which is what, that's just what they call it, um, they're, we're part of the Children's Advocacy Centers of Georgia, which is a statewide, it's our accrediting body. They now house this hotline. So when someone suspects that a child has experienced sex trafficking or human trafficking, we just don't really receive those because that's not really what we do. But when there's a suspected child victim of sex trafficking, the call goes to the state and then it gets, gets filtered down through the child advocacy centers. So if the child lives here or near us, we'll do the forensic interview, we'll do the resources, and then there's extra layers of support that those kids receive because that's a very complicated experience and very complicated crime <clears throat> most of the sex trafficking we see is not at all like somebody's scooped up and lives in a hotel and it's you know getting pimped out that's not really how it works for our clients um, a lot of them are still living at home a lot of them are you know staying home and they <coughs> eat dinner with their parents but with the internet with uh, exploitation you know they may be told that they have to do this thing and they receive money or you know it's just not it's not as they commercialized, even though it is still commercial exploitation. It's, you know, somebody in the neighborhood or somebody in the community or somebody they met in the, online in another state, but the child is still in their home. Um, so we are responding to those, but again, they are complicated. So our staff is getting a lot of training in how to best respond to those cases and those kids to make sure that they are served. Um, a little bit about child sexual abuse. That's the main type of abuse we serve. DFACS can handle a lot of the physical abuse cases. It's not as complicated. You can see it, you can ask about it, you can talk about it. Whereas sexual abuse is a lot more quiet, a lot more secretive. Um, the kids often feel like they're part of it and they feel shame about it, so they don't want to talk about it. So that's why we primarily serve that population, to give them a safe place to talk about what's happened. Um, one in 10 children will experience sexual abuse before they turn 18, so that's a lot of kids. Think about a classroom of 30 kids, that's three kids in a classroom. 60% um, never tell. I think I said 38 earlier, but 60% never tell. And then 90% know their abuser, which is one of the reasons why it's so hard to tell, because it's someone that is in your community or in your family or in your neighborhood. Um, it's really common for caregivers to have a hard time believing their child when they talk about they've been abused, because like I said earlier, you don't want to think somebody could do that. So our family advocates do a lot of work with caregivers to kind of just work through that feeling. 
it's normal that they feel that way, but it's always important that caregivers believe children because that's one of the number one indicators of healing. So we do a lot of work with the caregivers to help them, you know, work through those feelings outside of being with the child so that they can support the child. Um, kids almost never make up child sexual abuse, less than 10%. It's actually four to eight percent of cases are made up, um, and they're usually there's some other situation going on if they've made it up. There's usually a reason why. Um, we do sometimes see cases that nothing actually happened, but it wasn't a lie. It was just somebody heard something weird or saw something weird or wanted to make sure. Um, so we like when those happen, you know, when it didn't actually happen. But we don't consider that a fabricated case. It's just somebody was concerned. We looked into it, and nothing really happened. Um, so, all that to say, if a child ever tells you that they've experienced sexual abuse, always believe them. Um, if it didn't happen, we find out pretty quickly throughout the process of what we do. They're not gonna, they're not gonna get all the way through the process. Somebody's not gonna get arrested and go to jail if it didn't happen. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but from my experience in the way we do things, there's so many steps through it that a kid's not gonna hold on to that story that long and have all the details, details they need to make it that far. Um, like I said earlier, there's often not medical evidence because bodies heal really quickly. The delayed disclosure is so common, so we don't require medical evidence to have an arrest or prosecute. Um, really, it's the child's statement is sufficient for an arrest and charges, but we also see plenty of cases where no one is arrested and no one is charged and no one goes to jail because you've got a child statement versus an adult statement, and that can be really hard to prosecute and just kind of hard to work through. So. And then children who have disabilities are even more likely to experience sexual abuse. So we have some resources. If you have a, ch a child with disabilities or know someone who does, we have a lot of resources for those families about how to keep those kids safe, especially kids who can't talk. They can't tell about what's going on. Um, just some information. Sexual abuse is never a cry for attention. It's never somebody trying to get abuse. It's always a crime. It's always a traumatic event for the kid. Um, kids who experience sexual abuse have more negative consequences later in life. Mental health concerns, substance abuse concerns, physical health concerns actually. If you've heard of the ACEs study or if you know Team Up at all, they do a lot of work with ACEs. Um, but the idea is that these average childhood experiences or traumatic experiences in childhood change your brain and change your body and activate your stress cycle and lead to negative health outcomes later in life. Um, there's a link between child abuse and criminal activity, and it costs a lot of money for kids to be abused. 124 billion is the estimated lifetime cost with just one year of confirmed cases of maltreatment. So it costs us a lot of money. So we would like to not have it anymore, right? Um, I've said that most kids know their abuser. It's often a relative or someone the child knows well. Stranger danger almost never happens. It does sometimes, but we, I believe that those we're never going to be able to prevent. Those are freak accidents, fluke things. What we can prevent are these, we know people are not being protective and kids, abusers have access to kids. So that's why we educate adults to keep kids safe. And I've talked about grooming and manipulation. That happens in the whole family. And then most child sexual abuse victims do not go on to become abusers of any kind. Sometimes people think that if a child sexually abused, they grow up and become someone who abuses that's not the case. Um, and then most adult and adolescent perpetrators of sexual abuse, people who sexually abuse other people, were not sexually abused as children. Something likely happened, but there's not really that correlation between sexual abuse as a child and sexual abuse as an adult. Um, here's the good stuff, what we can do, how can we help. Um, learn about the issue, talk about the issue. Like I said, we do a lot of training so that people know what to look out for. Um, how to protect kids, how to report, how to educate other people. We really encourage adults to talk about with kids about their bodies, about body safety. If you have children, um, I actually brought some resources about what's healthy sexual development and how do you talk to kids about it. There's a lot of children's books we recommend, little ones, grandkids, your own kids. There's books you can read that help you have that conversation because it can be kind of uncomfortable. And it's a conversation that needs to be had over and over and over again. You know, it's just a normal conversation with the child. Um, let the kids you know that they can talk to you if something happens that's not okay. Kids need safe adults inside and outside the family that they can talk to if something happens. So if you're that for a kid, let them know. If anything happens, 
not just abuse, anything that's not okay, you can talk to me. Um, recognize the signs, but more importantly, I think it's trust your gut. If you feel like something's going on with a kid that isn't okay, do something about it. Talk to the child, ask for more about it. Is everything okay? Has something happened? If you're really concerned, make a report. Um, people who report in the state of Georgia, if it ends up being an unfounded claim, you are protected. You don't, nothing comes back on you. You can also report anonymously, so you don't have to tell them who you are. You can just say, hey, I have this concern about this kid, and then they can look into it. Um, this is the 1855GA child, is the number you call. It's on the back of our brochure. If you want to report that, a child, that you suspect that a child has been abused, you do not need evidence. You should not do any type of investigating. You don't need to ask a kid a bunch of questions. You don't need to go ask the potential offender about what happened. You don't want to do that. Just make that report. If a child is in immediate danger, we always recommend calling 911. DFACS and law enforcement work together. They report back and forth. So if you call one and it's a child abuse case, it'll get sent to the other. Um, we do a lot of these community awareness workshops. Um, I did one yesterday, a virtual training, doing one tonight at a specific group, but we do that free of charge for people in our community. So if you have a group of people that you want to do to spend more time, like an hour, two hours, to learn more about the issue, we can do that. And that's the Stewart's Children Training. You can follow us on social media. Right now we're doing a lot. Um, every day at noon we go live to draw a raffle prize. We're in our big fundraising raffle right now for Child Abuse Prevention Month. We do one prize every business day in April, and we do it on Facebook Live, so we show you our center. We went to Silver Queen yesterday, they were the prize winner, so I was like, we're doing a staff lunch, we're going to Silver Queen to draw the prize, because we run out of stuff to talk about. Um, so you can follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn, if that's your jam. Um, so you can follow us there, and then we always, always accept donations. We have a wish list on Amazon of specific items that we need or want. When kids are at our center, they're usually there for a couple hours. So we like to offer snacks and drinks. Um, like I said, we do blankets. We've made, during COVID, we started making coping kits to send home with kids. So like art supplies, Play-Doh, um, I don't know, other things, you know, that maybe they can use at home if they need it. Sometimes we do clothes, like if um, a family needs clothes or underwear or toiletries, we'll provide those if they need it. Really anything we can do to support the kids and families that come into our center, we are willing to do. Um, on your table, I gave you the thing about Kroger Community Rewards and Amazon Smile. A lot of nonprofits use that, so if you don't want to support us through that, I encourage you to pick somebody because it's not your money, it's their money. Um, so we'd love for you to pick us, but if you want to pick somebody else, that's okay too. So both of those, you just set it up and then every time you buy, it sends that person, that organization, a little bit of money. So, and it'll send you an email and let you know how you do and how you help somebody. So that's an easy way to do it. Uh, this is me. So you also have my business card. Um, and I'm here if you have questions, if you want to know anything else, I'm available. Creative artists can offer you a wide range of video production. Call the experts and discuss your project today, whether it's your special event or your company. Creative artist. 770-267-7368. Creative Artists produces this program you're watching. Call Creative Artists today. 770-267-7368. Creative Artists. They'll put you in the spotlight. Hi, welcome to Monroe Walton Center for the Arts. Uh, by the time you see this, right now we have our high school show in here, but by the time you see this, we will have the Congressional Art Contest in the gallery. Uh, that is a district-wide, it's uh, Congressman Heiss's 10th district, so it's not just Walton County. It's uh, the whole 10th district will be in here for a um, show of hand-picked works from high schools across the 10th district. And then we will have a reception um, and a winner will be announced on uh, Saturday the 24th. I believe the reception's at 10 a.m. So we'll have activities here from about 10 to noon on that Saturday. Um, it's kind of a big deal actually. Um, the winning piece is hung in one of the Capitol buildings in Washington, D.C. for a year. 
along with the other winners from the other congressional districts across the United States. Uh, the winner is actually flown with her family um, or his family to um, Washington for a ceremony and it's um, kind of a big deal. So um, come and see that show that will be here on uh, that week when you see this through the 24th and then after that we have our middle school show uh, that's Walton County coming in. So be sure to visit the gallery. In the shop, we've, we've got so many new items constantly coming in from our artists. Be sure to stop by and see all the beautiful things in the shop. Lots of springy, happy, beautiful things for you to see. Everything in our shop, of course, is made by our members. So they're all local here. We've got over 50 artists in our shop. So be sure, and you're directly supporting local artists when you shop with us. It, money is not going to China or Taiwan or anywhere else. It's right here in Monroe. So please do support our artists. We've got beautiful jewelry. I'm wearing some earrings and bracelets by our artists. So do please come in and see uh, what they have to offer. Very affordable, very unique, beautiful items. I think you'll be very pleased. Uh, it's a great place. Many, many people are discovering that this is their actually their favorite place to shop for gifts for Mother's Day, for birthdays, other events coming up. So come by and see the shop. See the gallery. We'll have the congressional show and then the middle school show. Um, and then after that, we have our camp show, uh, which brings up summer camp. Uh, we do have five weeks of summer camp planned. Uh, we have five weeks scattered throughout June and July. No camps in August at all, and then we'll start back with our school-type programming in September. So in July, June and July, we'll have five weeks of camp. We have four weeks of mixed media camp. Those are divided by ages between five and eight years old, and then nine to 12 years old. And then we have one week of pottery camp, and that's for ages eight and up. Um, we're also in the planning stages. I don't have the dates or any details yet, but uh, we're looking at uh, a creative writing camp. So that will be new to us. So we're working with somebody new to bring that um, to us. So be on the lookout for that. Everything is on our website, how to register, all the dates, all the fees, who's teaching what, um, and, and what all the pertinent information you need to know is on our website at MonroeWaltonArts.org and you can see, see it all there. Um, we also have pretty much everything on Facebook and of course you can come in to the Art Center and pick up a class list. The other new thing we have going on is we are open on Sundays now. These are new spring and summer hours. Uh, probably will not continue them after the summer, but we'll see. But for now, we're open uh, from one to five on Sundays, and that's in addition to our usual hours. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know about is, of course, our uh, garden tour. It's coming up on May 15th. Tickets are on sale now. We've sold about a quarter of our tickets so far. I'm feeling like we might sell out, so if you know you want to go, I would urge you to go ahead and buy your tickets. It is a rain or shine event. We don't anticipate having to cancel it for any reason, so uh, go ahead and buy your tickets if you know you want to come. Uh, we have eight, I believe, um, early bird prizes to encourage people to go ahead and buy their tickets in April. So we have special pricing in April of $25 per ticket. It goes to $30 per ticket in May. And then also in April, uh, if you buy your tickets, you qualify to enter into the drawings for our um, prizes. And they range from an original oil painting to um, a $200 gift card from uh, Grower's Outlet and a $50 gift card from Grower's Outlet. 
uh, and kind of everything in between. So um, come in, buy your tickets. You can only buy them in person because uh, we're actually going to hand you your ticket when you buy. Um, so we're not doing it online. You need to come in to buy your ticket. And the other new thing is also on Sundays, I meant to mention this before, uh, on Sundays we have Julie doing her beading classes. All that again is online, the dates. She's not gonna be here every Sunday, but she's gonna be here, um, I believe the 25th, and uh, then May 2nd or 3rd, whatever that Sunday is. So scattered dates, she will be here on Sundays doing her beading classes. Uh, and you can see the dates online at memberwaltonarts.org. Uh, you can pick up a class list when you come. You can check us out on Facebook. You'll find us at Monroe Walton Arts if you search that on Facebook. So we hope to see you soon. Have a great and happy and healthy spring. Get out and enjoy the sunshine. Come visit our sculpture garden. Uh, and we hope to see you soon. Hey, thanks a lot for tuning in again. It's been a little while since we showed you some of the dogs and cats here at the Walton County Animal Shelter, but we still are in business. We're still open. Uh, even though the coronavirus shut a lot of things down, we've still been taking in animals and thankfully moving a lot of the animals out. Even during this uh, quarantine periods of coronavirus, we had some of our best adoption and rescue rates in history. A lot of people fostering dogs, taking in dogs, so it's been great. But time rolls on and we still need some help. You can always look at our dogs and cats on our website, waltonpets.net. They're all listed there with information about them. When you see an animal you're interested in, you can submit an application or send an email. We'll set you up an appointment to do a meet and greet with the animal. We have outdoor pens. Uh, we also have indoor pens. So depending on your comfort level with social distancing and all that stuff, uh, you can meet an animal outdoors uh, with minimal contact with the staff to do the meet and greet before you adopt. So uh, it's not slowing us down. We're still finding homes for all these animals. So don't forget to look at waltonpets.net. You can see the dogs and cats listed there. And we're going to show you some of those right now that are here at the Walton County Animal Shelter. Here we have a lab pit mix. She's about a year or two old. She's a really timid girl till she gets to know you, but she definitely does not like men. So she would need to be an only child for a lady. This is Hickory. He was a stray found in Monroe and he was pretty thin and sickly when we got him. But now he's starting to open up more and he's about one to two years old. This is Maddie. She is a lab Rottweiler mix and she is about five months old. She's very sweet and playful. She's had all her shots. She was found on Misty Hill Road and she will be ready um, April 14th. This is a stray we picked up in Social Circle yesterday. Um, he's very sweet. We haven't named him just yet, but he will be ready for adoption uh, come next week. And he's very sweet and likes other dogs so far. The mission of Project Renewal is to provide the support and services necessary for families and individuals in the Georgia counties of Rockdale, Newton, and Walton to live in a violence-free home. So back in 2012, I met my partner and um, we were together for a few months and then we became pregnant. Um, not long after we met each other, um, he wanted me to move in with him and became pretty possessive already in the first few months of being together. Um, not long after I became pregnant, he wanted to move us out of state, and he did. We moved out of state, had me quit my job, and while we were up there, um, I didn't have much contact with my family, but um, I was able to come back down to Georgia to be able to birth my son. Um, not long after that, he moved us to Florida and everything actually seemed really nice. He moved us around a lot. Um, different jobs, different houses, new environments all the time. 
Um, and I kind of now realize that he was trying to keep me from making connections with people and having close relationships with anybody. Um, while in Florida, things became escalated. He started verbally abusing me a good bit. He started mentally abusing me, um, putting me down constantly. And it was kind of a cycle of, you know, one day he could be really nice. And then the next day and the next day, it starts building up with tension and everything seems to be my fault. It doesn't matter what I do. It's not right. And then before you know it, he lashes out. Um, it was not until 2015 he put his hands on me physically and um, one morning and knocked me out. And the police came and they arrested him. And I told my family about that incident and I tried to leave. And upon leaving, I went home to my family and I did not go to a shelter. I did not seek help other than my family. And although they were supportive, I was not in the right mindset. I, did, I was lost and very confused. And so I ended up going back to him just a couple months later. And um, it really got worse when I got back because there was resentment of me leaving. And the next year that I was with him, it was constant physical abuse. Um, it was, you know, he was never home. Um, it was constant physical abuse and my son was witnessing it. And um, I took it for about a year. When I heard about Project Renewal, I realized that there were options out there. Um, I had always heard of a shelter or a safe house, but you don't hear much about them because obviously, you know, most places like that are gonna stay more anonymous. Um, so we were able to contact the Sheriff's Department for Walton County um, from Florida and, you know, kind of let them know what was going on and the risk that was being involved with me leaving Florida, um, the threats that were made towards me. And I was able to kind of make like an escape plan um, with my family. And I was able to kind of read up on that, on the Project Renewal website and learn about, you know, the things that you really need to take along with you, the things that are not, you know, materialistic things that can be replaced and the things that are very important documents. Um, I was able to kind of get a binder together, get all this information together. And I was able to leave um, one morning while my abuser was at work and me and my son hopped in the car and we drove seven hours straight to the sheriff's department. And from the sheriff's department, I called Project Renewal and spoke with them over the phone. And um, they were very kind to me on the phone, um, very empathetic, which is something that I had not had a lot of, you know, emotion towards lately. And um, I was able to drive over to the location with an escort. And um, once I got there, I didn't realize how tense I had felt from the whole situation. And I didn't realize like the, type, the state of mind that I was in because once I got there and I realized I was actually safe, my whole body just like broke down, but a good breakdown. It was, I felt relieved. I felt relieved and I felt like I could breathe for once. I had felt like I was drowning for so long and it took me a long time to realize the danger I was in because I didn't want to admit that I was the victim in it. Monroe Country Day School's mission is to inspire every student to have a passion for academic and personal excellence through creative learning, independent thinking, and selfless service to others. Students are exposed to the local community and provided opportunities for independent thinking. What will you do with all the dirt? Some of the dirt you see has been hauled over here because they're going to have to build the finish floor or the elevation of the building so that it's got to have the right kind of soil that will compact and tighten up for the footing of the building. Monroe Country Day School values the whole child. Therefore, we believe in a holistic and integrated approach 
that involves the development of the student academically, personally, and socially. Monroe Country Day School believes that creative learning produces independent thinking and fosters a love of learning. Excellence is applied to all that we do. We strive to foster students that are pursuing strong academic and personal excellence. Project-based education is integrated into our curriculum. When we go back in the classroom, we need the combined weight of you guys because we've got to figure our uh, bridge, our mass bridge weight ratio, okay? you got to figure out how much weight it was that finally broke your bridge, okay? And then on Monday, we're going to redesign. We, we, we figured out where some of our flaws are. We're going to spend another week redesigning, all right? Monroe Country Day School offers personalized education that begins with the personal knowledge of each student academically and each student's personal story. We believe that taking personal responsibilities for one's academic and personal choices produces strong, independent, capable, and confident citizens. Students are taught responsibility for self, peers, and community. Through service to one's peers and community, an equipped leader finds personal growth and fulfillment. We facilitate this leadership through providing experiences of service. Respect is the basis for good dialogue, independent thinking, and mutual enjoyment of life lived in community. Monroe Country Day School is designed for families who see the value of educating the whole child. Monroe Country Day School will reach its mission by maintaining small class sizes, offering project-based learning, and a high-level curriculum, and by providing service opportunities in an aesthetically pleasing environment. Monroe Country Day School has positioned itself to produce a community of young people who are strong in mind and character and living as contributing members in their community. For more information, please contact Mandy Wellington, Admissions Director at 770-267 eight nine five five
great job today. Boy, Ryan, ready to go and fire it up here. About ready to pull your arm out of socket. I don't know how many songs had Georgia in there. Oh, goodness. Baby, what you got going on Saturday? You know, we were chatting, I was going to be a party. Out of town about half a mile. 25 seconds of playing time here for Ryan. Oh, my goodness. You can't have way too much fun today. Six feet, four inches, do it for now. Still not a bird. you've enjoyed the spring splashdown um, on the town green tonight uh, this has been a fun day that's lasted all day uh, about 12 hours I think but the dogs were so interesting and um, the competition was really keen between the dogs uh, this is Paul Mullins with Walton Entertainment Let's read, I'm Big Enough. It's by Amber Stewart and Lane Marlowe. Let's read. Bean was big enough. She was big enough to hop all the way around Stickleback Pond without stopping. She was big enough to go dandelion picking and to choose the juiciest ones for Mommy to cook. Bean was even big enough to swing the highest of all her friends so high, her giggles could be heard over and beyond Bluebell Wood. So high, her tummy tumbled as she flew up. She was big enough to do all these things. But was Bean big enough to stop taking her blanket just about everywhere she went? No, said Bean. I love my blankie. Maybe you could try doing things without your blanket, said Mommy and Daddy gently. Yes, blankets are for babies, said Bean's big brother. No, they're not, said Bean. 
So Bean made a plan just in case her family decided to take her blanket away. She called it the Keep Blanky Forever Plan. Early in the morning, Bean set out to hide her blanket in a special secret place. It wasn't on the edge of Stickleback Pond because the frogs might find it. It wasn't between the branches of Thunderstruck Tree because the birds might take it. It wasn't buried in the soft earth because the mice might want it. Bean was just wondering if she would ever find the right spot when she saw a hollow log hidden by overgrown bushes. Bean hid her blanket deep in the hollow log and hurried home. She was happy all day knowing that the blanket was safe. But when bedtime drew near, Bean wanted her blanket. She had never had a bedtime without cuddling her blanket, and she didn't want one now. So Bean set out to her secret hiding place to bring her blanket back home. The woods looked different in the early evening light. All the hollow logs seemed the same, and now Bean wasn't sure which one was her hiding place. Was her blanket in that hollow log? Or that one? Or that one? Oh no, cried Bean. My plan didn't work. I've lost Blanky. Poor Bean had no choice but to return home blanketless. And close to tears, she saw Mommy. Bean, where did you go? Mommy asked. To look for Blanky, <laughs> sniffed Bean. But I couldn't find it. Bean's family was very kind about the lost blanket disaster. Daddy read her two extra bedtime stories, and Mommy made her hot milk to help her sleep. And Bean's brother lent her his second favorite teddy bear. Bean didn't like her first bedtime without her blanket. She didn't much like her second or third either. But soon, looking for her blanket turned into looking for ladybugs and four-leaf clovers and making the very best hideouts and going hollow log sledding until Bean had forgotten all about her blanket. One windy spring day, a long time later, Bean and her friends were chasing dandelion seeds in the sunny part of the woods when she saw the strangest thing. Bean looked at the tiny baby fox and knew now that her mommy was right. She really was much too big for her blanket. The end.